Chapter Eight of Bob's A Girl Detective. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Bob's A Girl Detective by Grace May North. Chapter Eight A New Friend. At that early hour, there were no customers in the shop but Roberta saw three young women of widely varying ages who were dusting and putting things in order for the business of the day. Mr. Queerwitz went at once to a tall, spare woman of about fifty, whose light reddish hair suggested that the colour had been applied from without. "'Miss Peerwinkle,' he said rather abruptly, "'here's the new clerk I was telling you about. "'You'd better show her the lay of things before it gets busy.' Miss Peerwinkle turned, and her washed-out blue eyes seemed to look down at Roberta from the great height where, at least, she believed that her position as head saleslady at the Queerwitz antique shop had placed her. "'Your name, miss?' she inquired, when the proprietor had departed toward the rear door labelled No Admittance. Bobs had been so amused by all that she had seen that she hardly heard the inquiry, and when at last she did become conscious of it— for one wild moment she couldn't recall her new name, and so she actually hesitated. Luckily, just then, one of the other girls called to Miss Peerwinkle to ask her about a tag, and in that brief moment, Bobs remembered. When the haughty head lady turned her coldly inquiring eyes again toward the new clerk, Roberta was able to calmly reply, Dora Doolittle. Miss Peerwinkle sniffed. Perhaps she was thinking it a poor name for an efficient clerk to possess. Bobs's sense of humour almost made her exclaim, I ought to have chosen Dora do much. Then she laughingly assured herself that that wouldn't have done at all, as she did not believe that there was such a name, and surely she had heard of Doolittle. Bobs's soliloquy was broken in upon by a strident voice calling, Miss Doolittle, you're not paying any attention to what I am saying. Right here and now, let me tell you, daydreaming isn't permitted in this shop. I was telling you to go with Nell Wiggin to the cloakroom, and don't be gone more than five minutes. Mr. Queerwitz don't pay salaries for prinking. Bobs was desperately afraid that she wouldn't be able to get through the morning without laughing, and yet there was something tragic about the haughtiness of this poor Miss Peerwinkle. Meekly she followed a thin, pale girl of perhaps twenty-three, the two who were left in the shop at once began to express their indignation because a new clerk had been brought in for them to train. "'If ever anybody looked the greenhorn, it's her,' Miss Peerwinkle exclaimed disdainfully, and Miss Harriet Dingley agreed. They said no more, for the new clerk, returning, said, "'What am I to do first? Unfortunately, Roberta asked this of the one nearest, who happened to be Miss Harriet Dingley. That woman actually looked frightened as she said, "'nodding toward her companion. "'Don't ask me. I'm not head lady. She is.' "'Again Bobs found it hard not to laugh, "'for Miss Peerwinkle perceptibly stiffened, "'and her manner seemed to say, "'You evidently aren't used to class "'if you can't tell which folks are head and which aren't. "'But what she really said was, "'Nell Wiggin will show you around, "'and do be careful you don't knock anything over. "'If you do, your salary's stopped. "'I'll be very careful, Miss Peerwinkle, the new clerk said, but she was thinking, Docked! My salary docked! I know what it is to dock a coal barge, for I have one in front of my home, but... Oh, Miss Doolittle, please do watch where you go. You almost ran into that Venetian vase. There was real kindness and concern in the voice of the pale, very weary-looking young girl at her side, and in that moment Bobs knew that she was going to like her. Poor little thing, Bobs thought. She looks as though some unkind fate had put out the light that ought to be shining in her heart. I wish that I might find a way to rekindle it. Very patiently, Miss Nell Wiggin explained the different departments in the antique shop. Suddenly she began to cough and sent a frightened glance toward the closed door that bore the sign No Admittance, then stifled the sound in her handkerchief. Nothing was said, but Roberta understood. The old furniture greatly interested Bobs. In her own home, there were many beautiful antiques. Casually, she inquired, How does Mr. Queeritz manage to obtain so much rare old furniture? 
To her surprise, Nell Wiggin looked quickly around to be sure that no one was near. Then she said, I ought not to tell you, but I will if you'll keep it dark. Dark as the deepest dungeon, Roberta replied, much puzzled by her comrade's mysterious manner. The slight girl drew close. He makes it behind that door that nobody's allowed to go through, she said in a low voice, then added, evidently wishing to be fair. But that's nothing unusual. Lots of dealers make their antiques, and the public goes on buying them, knowing they may not be as old as the tags say. Here now are the old books, and at least they are honest. Bobs uttered a cry of joy. Oh, how I do wish I could have charge of this department, she said. I adore old books. There was a light in the pale face of little Miss Wiggin. I do, too, she said. That is, I love Dickens. I never read much else. Then, almost wistfully, she added, I didn't have much chance to go to school, but once, where I went to live, I found an old set of Dickens's books that someone had left, and I've just read them over and over. I never go out nights, and the people living in those books are such a lot of company for me. Again Bobs felt a yearning tenderness for this frail girl, who was saying, They're all the friends I've ever had, I guess. Impulsively the new clerk exclaimed, I'll be your friend if you'll let me. Just then a strident voice called, Miss Wiggin, forward. You stay with the books, Nell said softly, and I'll do the china. Bobs watched the slight figure that was hurrying toward the front, and she sighed with tears close to the hazel eyes, and in her heart was a prayer. May I be forgiven for the selfish, heedless years I have lived, but perhaps now I can make up for it. Surely I shall try. Roberta had been told by Mr. Jewett that she must not reveal to anyone her real reason for being at the antique shop, and, as Mr. Queeritz had no faith in the girl's ability to waylay a pilferer, he did not care to have Miss Nell Wiggin devote more time to teaching her the business of selling antiques. This information was conveyed by Miss Peerwinkle to Nell, who was told to stay away from the new clerk, with the added remark, If she didn't get on to the ropes with one hour's showing, she's too stupid for this business anyhow. Why the head lady had taken such an evident dislike to her, Bobs could not understand, for surely she was willing to do whatever she was told. Ah, oh, well, she wasn't going to worry. Worrying is what makes one old, she thought, as she mounted a small step-ladder on casters that one could push along the shelves. From the top of it she examined the books that were highest. Suddenly she uttered an exclamation of delight, then looked about quickly to be sure that she had not been heard. Customers in the front part of the store occupied the attention of the three clerks, so Roberta reached for a volume that had attracted her attention. It was indeed rare and old, so very old that she wondered that the covers did not crumble, and it had illumined letters. Perhaps they were made by early monks, Bobs was thinking. She sat down on the ladder and began turning the fascinating pages that were yellow with age. Suddenly she was conscious that someone stood near her. She looked up to find the accusing gaze of the head clerk fixed upon her. Bobs was startled into exclaiming, "'Say, Miss Peerwinkle, a cat has nothing on you when it comes to walking softly, has it?' The reply was frigidly given. "'Miss Do Little, with emphasis, "'you are supposed to dust the books, not read them, "'and what's more, that particular book is the rarest one in the whole collection. "'There's a mate to it somewhere, and when Mr. Queerwitz finds it, "'he can sell the two of them to Mr. Lionel Van Loon "'for one thousand dollars in cool cash.' Roberta was properly impressed, and replaced the book. Then, taking a duster, she proceeded to tidy her department. At eleven o'clock, Bobs wondered if she ought to wander about the shop and watch the occasional customer. This she did, and was soon in the neighbourhood of Miss Wiggin. "'You're to go out to eat when I do,' Nell told her. "'I'm glad to hear it,' was the reply. Promptly at noon, Miss Wiggin beckoned and said, "'Come, Miss Doolittle, be as quick as you can. "'We only have half an hour nooning, and every minute counts. "'I go around to my room. "'You might buy something, then come with me and eat it.' "'Roberta could hardly believe what she had heard. "'Only half an hour to wash, go somewhere, eat your lunch and get back?' "'Why the mad rush?' she exclaimed. "'Doesn't Mr. Queerwitz know there's an eternity ahead of us?' 
The one smile was the only answer. Miss Nell Wiggin was not wasting time. She led to the cloakroom, donned her outdoor garments, and then, taking her new friend by the hand, she said, Hold fast to me. We'll take a shortcut through the back stockroom. It's black as soot in there when it isn't lit up. Mr. Queerwitz won't let us burn lights except for business reasons. Bobs found herself being led through a room so dark that she could barely see the two walls of boxes that were piled high on either side, with a narrow path between. They soon emerged upon a back alley, where huge cans of refuse stood, and where trucks were continually passing up and down, or standing at the back entrances of stores, loading and unloading. "'Now walk as fast as you can,' little Miss Wiggin said, as away she went toward Fourth Avenue, with Roberta close behind her. If Bobs had known what was going to happen that noon, she would not have left the shop. End of chapter 8